good morning, everyone. You don't even know what had to happen for this to make this possible uh, for today. Um, I can't even blame Christopher for this, actually, and I'll tell you why in a second. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another amazing Monday Mindset meeting. I am your host, uh, Coach Kalu, here from our studios in beautiful Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, we, I, I'm so happy to have my cohort uh, and also co-host Christopher Lawrence to talk about uh, healthy transformation in a few moments here. Uh, I just have to double check and triple check everything today because we had a real rough start in all like four or five people connecting today. So anyway, enough about that. But before we get started, we're really excited for you to be here. This is a great time to remind you in the chat room, please, if you could let us know what business are you in as well as where are you in the world? You want to tag that so that way Christopher and I can kind of have a sense of who's here, so to speak. Um, we have quite a few folks on here today. So we just want to make sure we're able to uh, address certain things. We're going to talk about healthy transformation. And you may be wondering, what does that have to do with a business owner? What does that have to do with regular Joes? How does that impact uh, your leadership? How does that impact your life? Christopher will tell all in a few seconds. You will also notice that Catherine is not here. I know you guys all have been looking for Catherine. Uh, today we have Christopher Lawrence. Uh, Christopher, that's Christopher. the other Lawrence, Shane Lawrence. It's so hard to keep them all organized. Uh, Shane Lawrence is sitting in for Catherine today. And so he's going to be monitoring their chat room. So if you see messages coming from Shane or anything like that, it's going to be um, uh, him uh, sitting in for Catherine. Okay. So before we get into all that stuff, you know, every Monday, and now I know why people dread Mondays, right? Because it's sometimes a little bit of a gong show. So for whatever reason, we couldn't all get our sound or video or something like that connected, but we got it now. So without further de delay, because we have Christopher who's going to be talking a little bit uh, for us and he's going to be able to stick around hopefully for the next, um, after the meeting for about 15 minutes or so. And so that's a great opportunity for you to engage uh, him and Anel as well in the Q&A. And the format, if you're joining us for the first time, we're gonna have a conversation around the mindset of healthy transformation. What does that really mean? We are going to leave you uh, with one or two actions that you can take this week to jumpstart that mindset. And then we have an opportunity to do a Q&A um, as well. So you can ask some specific questions uh, for yourself or maybe someone else. And if you do have comments and stuff like that, please put it in the chat box. And if you're okay to speak, uh, we may call on you and you could unmute yourself and we could be able to see you as well. And if you don't have your video on for those who are joining us live, uh, please do. And those who are listening, thank you so much for listening again. Okay. Now that that's out of the way, uh, Christopher Lawrence is going to chat with us about healthy transformation. Now, in addition to having his own personal successful weight loss story, as I do as well, Christopher Lawrence is a certified master coach and founder of Change My Life Coaching and the co-founder of Change My Business Coaching. Um, he and Dr. Michael Breen have been running the Healthy Transformation Program, which they founded since 2014 with outstanding success. Christopher's specialization in this program is increasing motivation and focus, habit and behavioral modifications, and mindful eating, which is really what we're going to try to talk about in a second. As a certified master coach, he truly cares about the success and achievement of every single person he comes in contact with. His goal is to um, revolutionize the weight loss industry by bringing the, to the forefront the habits, behaviors, and accurate knowledge required to ensure successful weight loss. That is a lot, Christopher Lawrence. How the heck are you going to do that? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Christopher Lawrence. How are you, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you? Fantastic. I didn't miss anything there, did I? No? Got everything? I don't know. It was a mouthful, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. Speaking of mouthful, what exactly is Healthy Transformation? Yeah, so Healthy Transformations is, is in short terms, it's, it's a contemporary sustainable weight loss program uh, with a very, very strong focus on reducing inflammation in the body. Actually, you know, Dr. Breen and I talk about this often, which is should we call it a weight loss program? Should we call it an anti-inflammatory program? Should we call it a uh, chronic illness program? Because all of those would apply. 
Right. I mean, why is it such a big struggle? I mean, like, let's just back up for a second. Like this whole thing of weight loss, like what's, what's happening? Cause we hear a lot of negative connotation and sometimes we have judgments of people when they don't look like us, or even okay. those people who are also overweight have that as well. Like, why do you think that's happening? Which part, Kyle, which, what's the specific question? Sorry, I want to make just, sure I answer the yeah, right Yeah, just the weight loss. Like one, why do we have struggle with weight? And two, why is there a mm -hmm. lot of judgment of those folks who are overweight? Like, is that really a pandemic yeah. itself? Was weight loss? I think, I, I think um, in terms of judgment, I think you'd have to ask the individuals, but I think judgment almost always comes from a place of fear. So, you know, about, uh, you know, about something that you're experiencing uh, for yourself or, or, you know, fear, fear of others or fear of something that you don't want to see in yourself. I think that's where judgment comes from uh, a lot of the time, uh, unless you're dealing with narcissism, which is a totally different uh, ball game. But, um, you know, and, and what was the other question, Kyle? I'm sorry. It's just around weight loss. Why is that such a big issue? Like, why do we have yeah, lots it, of folks overweight it, or as a society? Yeah, we, we do in Canada now, more than 50% of the population is, is obese or overweight. And I see that Dr. Breen is on here as well. So we might have him chime in on, on uh, that specific question. But, but in, you know, certainly in Canada, as well as the United States, more than 50% of our population is overweight or obese. And, and uh, you know, I think, some of it is cultural, some of it is educational, some of it is um, access to food, you know. So, so this is one of the things that we talk about in the HT program is that, uh, you know, when we were growing up, you know, I think the grocery store, you know, if we were in a bigger city was open on Sundays at some point in my life, but it wasn't always open on a Sunday, you know, and, mm. and, and so accessibility to food, I mean, you can have pretty much whatever you want, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? Yeah. So I think accessibility to food, you know, with a lack of education. And, and of course, the food is built, you know, it, it, it's manufactured in such a way that you'll want to keep eating. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like food, food is about marketing now. And you know, with that comes that piece around what you're trying to say is because of all that marketing there, we have to be mindful of what we're eating as well as the habits and the behaviors that goes with that. Like, you know, and, and maybe later on we could ask Dr. Breen a little bit about the science behind this. Um, but how did you guys get a chance to kind of couple those two things, the science and the, the behavioral side? Yeah. So Dr. Breen and I were part of a, a networking group together where we met and we were you know, uh, Mike had always wanted to have a, a weight loss program, but there was this thing about the sustainability of it, the behaviors of it. And so he tapped on my shoulder and said, hey, do you think some of the stuff that you do would work for weight loss? And I'm like, 100% it would, you know, and, you know, and so it started, we kicked off our first year and, and away we went. And so I think we're, we'll be entering our seventh year, I think, uh, this this fall, we're taking registrations already, actually. We've got folks signed up already for our January program. Oh, wow, already started, right? Mm -hmm. And so the program itself is a, um, uh, what is it, 12, 12 month? I was gonna say 12 years, but 12 month, it's for yeah. life, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's a 12 month program, and uh, it's meeting twice a month, and now we're moving um, uh, to an online uh, format completely, of course, because of COVID. So getting people together in groups is not um, uh, something that we're doing anymore in our world. So, so actually this is kind of cool because the program has only ever been Calgary based and now it's opened up. Um, uh, we'll be able to take people from all over the place now. So. Mm -hmm. And so what mindset should someone kind of walk in with this program? I mean, uh, or let me clarify that. What mindset do people usually walk in when they have, um, when they, they join this program? And from your opinion, what mindset do they end up leaving with? Or maybe what's sustainable for them? A little bit jumpy on that question. Yeah, so, so what I would say is that um, uh, people come into the program for all sorts of reasons. Certainly weight loss is probably the primary reason, but, right. but the, you know, there's a big misunderstanding about what weight gain is here. Weight gain is also a sign of inflammation in the body, right? So some people go into program, like I can have you lose weight eating gummy bears and zesty cheese Doritos. 
I can get you to lose weight doing that, but it doesn't actually solve the systemic issues. And so a lot of what our program is, is about stepping in with the understanding that you're going to learn about food behaviors and food science. Uh, you know, physiology, the whole, you know, the whole rest of it. Most of the people walk out of our program with more knowledge than, you know, than an average nutritionist might have um, okay. a- about how body, h- how food impacts their body. You know, so, uh, you know, so the key, the key thing here is to be aware of, you know, when, when you step in, you're coming for food education mm-hmm. too, right? And, and of course, the mindset that people leave with is that awareness. Right. I, I think without the awareness piece, you can't change it. I, I want to introduce a concept, actually. It's, it's called a, um, uh, oh, now it's leaving my brain, a something surge. I posted this on my LinkedIn. Do you remember what that was, Kyle? The, uh, no, I don't remember. I remember us talking yeah, about I it actually just remember. on the weekend, surge too. Surge capacity. That's surge what it capacity. Is. Was it? Okay. Surge yeah, capacity. Yeah. yeah, we were so, just talking so about that. So surge capacity is the thing that we all do on January 1st. I'm yes. going to do this and this and this and this yes. and this within this year. And then, yeah. and then do you know what the number one New Year's resolution is? Weight loss. Weight loss. Yeah. That's the number one New Year's resolution. And do you know what? And, and, and do you know how many people actually complete their New Year's resolutions to completion? No, but I do know. Eight to nine percent. But I do know the date mm-hmm. specifically when they drop that habit. Yes. Yeah, so what date is that? February the 14th. Actually, the second Thursday in February. The second Thursday. Okay, I thought it was February it's the 14th. the second Thursday in February, people, people drop their New what? Year's resolutions. So, so, so bear with me for a second. Bear with okay. me for a second. Okay. We've got this thing called surge capacity, meaning we surge. We do this with loss in our lives, right? Whether it be like something at work, a project you're working on, something personal, something professional, that, you know, maybe it's crafting, maybe it's whatever, and you surge and it feels really good. And then that capacity runs out and you have to replenish, right? Mm. And so relying on your surge or what we might call motivation and momentum, relying on that motivational piece doesn't actually keep you going. Motivation and willpower are extremely weak, right? Like they start the fire, but they don't keep it going. Mm -hmm. So our surge capacity is another way of saying this, where we can surge through something and, and then we adapt and adjust and then we kind of settle. Um, but by the second Thursday in February, people are, are, they stop doing their, on average, they stop doing their, their um, New Year's resolutions. Did you also know that the second Thursday in February is one of the highest sales for fast food in North America? Shut up. So they know yeah. it's like they, and that's the thing, right? Like this whole grooming process of food yeah. and what people have access to. And the fact that they know that, that they know to be able to, to do that. So how does someone prepare themselves against that? Like, you know, thank you. Um, what is, what is that? I mean, I don't know if that's where you talk about the habit loop and I hope you could share that with our listeners and sure. viewers today, because I think that is a big, I remember experiencing that when I was in the program myself. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think the entire program from a behavioral perspective comes down to awareness. You know, so you can't, you, can't change, you can't effectively change something that you're not aware of. And I think people underestimate the value of doing a detailed look. You know, I'm kind of like a, a hack and slash kind of guy, right? Like I, I like to come in and, you know, make change and see a massive result in a very short period of time. And of course, I'm the only person on this call that does that. Um, (laughs) but you know, but, but the truth is actually, it's when you get into the micro details that you can make massive change. So what I would say is that the first part is to accept that you've got weird food behaviors, right? Because most of us do, most of us have a relationship with food that comes from somewhere, right? And so you've got, you know, we've all got food behaviors and some of those behaviors are weird. And what I would say is that if you, you know, if, if you start to become aware of the nuances as opposed to changing all of it at once. So imagine it this way. It's like, oh, I need to eat healthy. That's the habit that I want to establish. Okay. Well, the challenge with a habit like that is that it's <clears throat> like, it's a great goal, but that's an extremely long-term goal, like maybe years long, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> and so what, what ends up happening is we lose motivation and momentum because we have a bad week. So we throw in the towel but actually people underestimate the number of habits that are involved with eating healthy. 
We know that on average, there's over 200 choices that you make a day related to your food. Wow. That could be size of plate, type of utensil you use to eat it, how you prepare it, where you serve it, right? And, and so some of these are micro decisions. Oh, micro decisions. There's a clue there, right? So, so in a day, you have, you know, we've got this thing called a habit loop, right? Or, or yeah. some people know it as a positive feedback loop, right? So it's the cue, the routine, and the reward, right? And so there's something that kicks it off, right? So we walk into a movie theater and we smell what? Lettuce. Popcorn. Oh. Anybody go to a crappy movie because you just wanted the popcorn? I've done that. It's like, let's go see a movie. There's nothing I want to see. Well, <laughs> they have popcorn at least. Do so you smell the popcorn? That's your trigger. The behavior right. is that you go to the counter and you purchase the popcorn. Mm -hmm. Okay. You go to the counter, you purchase the popcorn and you start to eat the popcorn and then there's a payoff or a reward. So then you enjoy that. And if the reward is strong enough, you want to complete that habit loop again. But what people don't understand is that in a day you could have, you know, tens to hundreds of habit loops all related to food. So trying to change food all at once is right. kind of like setting yourself up for failure. So the idea here would actually be that you look at a micro habit. And, and if we've got a minute here, Kyle, I'd love to give a personal example of where. Please. Where yeah. And, and yeah. And, and it's interesting before we get into that, you just actually triggered a memory for me growing up. My mom would always say, don't eat with a spoon because she's like people who are gluttonous does that. Like they, they do that. They eat with a spoon. And I'm just like, Really? So trained myself to eat with a fork. And I mean, I don't know if that does it, did anything for me. Yeah, but... in, you know, it's interesting. I think, I think that what you're pointing out is what we, you know, is what we call the, you know, the culture of food, right? And, mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. So how many of you were told that you had to eat all of the food on your plate and then you would right. be rewarded with dessert? With dessert, right. yes. So here's the, here's the problem with something like that, right? Here's the problem with something like that. We will overconsume what's on our plate because we're probably actually finished eating before our plate is empty. Like our, our satiety level mm -hmm. is probably finished before the food has gone on our plate. And so then, so then what do we do? We force ourselves. And to this day, you know, I'm 40 years old and I still do this to this day where I'm like, try and leave some food uh, on your plate. Try and leave some food on your plate, right? And it's a difficult thing, right? I feel a way about it, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so... So we, you know, we, you know, we, we eat all the food and then we're rewarded with what? More calories with a high inflammatory food like ice cream or right. popcorn or, right. or whatever, you know, so, you know, so it's, it's kind of the same thing. I also know that growing up, you know, certainly in, um, you know, my, my parents are split up, but certainly in my dad's household, if you, you know, you filled up your own dish and you were warned, don't dish up too much because you have to eat it all. Otherwise it's waste. And so, of course, as a child, you don't know what the right portion of food is. You just, right. you fill up what, you know, what looks good on your plate, right? Your mm -hmm. eyes are always hungrier than your belly, right? So, right. so these kinds of, you know, these kinds of strange things happen. So your example, Kyle, speaks about the culture of food and actually how mindless we are about food. Mm -hmm. We are completely mindless about food, you know, and, and so... So even in my own personal example, we talk about the, the micro changes that need to happen. Um, uh, one of the things that took me years to kick the habit of was um, uh, zesty cheese Doritos. Oh, man, those little orange devils. They, you know, they taste like chemical to me now, but, you know, but, but man, I could just not stop eating them, you know. And, and it, you know, it would kind of kick off a, a weekend of bad eating, right? So Friday nights, I'd go fill up my car with gas. And then I'd go to the gas station and get zesty cheese Doritos. But it probably took me two years to figure out that that's what I was doing before I understood this concept of looking at it in a really micro way. Right. And so I tried everything. It's like, just, you know, you know, just don't buy the chips, you know, this and that, whatever else. And, and that kind of thing. And of course I would, and then I'd get in the car and the bag of chips would be open before I'd even start my car and drive away. Wow. Of course, I'm the only one that does this. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, but um, uh, I think there's a, you know, a, you know, a really important clue in this, the simple answer, and it took me a bit to figure this out. The simple answer was just don't get gas on Friday night. 
Okay. If I don't get gas on Friday nights and I come home and there's no chips on my house, the likelihood that I'm going to have a healthier weekend uh, has increased significantly. But you have to get into these micro details. Like instead of focusing on every single aspect of your food and your meal all at once, the idea would be to focus on maybe even just a portion of your meal you know, for, for long-term success. Now, when people come into the HD program, we give them everything all at once. And mm -hmm. why is that? Well, it's because we need people to start having the learnings as quickly as possible. And then what we focus on is, is the micro habitual change as we go along. So when we do that, what we found is that, okay, we start really high and people are expected to be up here, you know, way at the top, but then they kind of, you know, some, some, not all, taper off, right? But where they settle might be here or here, whereas the starting point was much lower, right? So the idea is that wherever their settling place is, we can now start to work on bringing them back up. And I cannot tell you how important self-efficacy is during all of this too. Like we have got to stop beating ourselves up about food. Holy cow. It, that is a nasty cycle that gets us into all sorts of trouble. But we've got to be extremely self-compassionate and self-regulating. Uh, Christopher, if you could hold that thought on the what we do to beat our stuff up, because I'd like to get into some of that specific in the Q&A section um, after the meeting, if that's okay, because I think people need to hear sure. that story and then to hear what people have said about that story and what they can actually do about it, because I'm sure we have that self-saboteur, you know, um, saboteur in us that we, we constantly uh, hear that voice. I'm just curious if Dr. Breen is available um, from, if he no. could... No, he sent me a quick message. He had to step away. He had to step away. Okay, because I was just curious yeah. about the science side of it. Um, now, why do you think, and I think I know that number from uh, when I did the program with you guys, but the rate of people, like what is recidivism for the rate of people going back, like losing the weight, put them back on, losing the weight, put them back on? Like what is yeah, that Yeah, that's a great question. So in a typical weight loss program, mm -hmm. The ch this is in clinical research. So in real life, it would probably be less. But in clinical research, it's 97 to 98% of people who lose weight in a clinical study will put it back on within 12 months. Wow. Isn't that so discouraging to hear? That's crazy. It's so discouraging to hear. 97 to 98% in clinical research. So I don't think that clinical research is always real life. It's, it's not right. real life. I think in real life, the percentage is lower than that, probably, you know, in the 80 plus range still. Mm -hmm. But I think the key thing here is that there's so much focus on like, on the losing of the weight, but there's not enough focus on the behavioral or the, right. or, or, or the inflammatory side. I think that I think that the reason why we're so science heavy in our program is because when you have the knowledge, when you have the knowledge, even if you choose to eat something that wouldn't be like, say, compliant in the program, you have a, you have a level of awareness about what's happening to you down to a cellular level, right? right? You know, and I, and I think that that creates a level of motivation and awareness for people. So it's like, okay, I know what's happening by eating this. But, you know, knowledge needs to be the first thing without correct knowledge. So, so that's what we focus on. So that is the rate of recidivism, which is why our program is 12 months, because we want to get you past that first 12 months. There is a greater likelihood that, that, you're, that your success of keeping the weight off increases after the 12-month period, Right. Is there's a greater likelihood of success. Yeah. yeah I mean, because you have those behaviors for 12 months or you've mm -hmm. been working at it constantly. One of the best, the, the biggest thing I took away from the program was in it. When we talk about knowledge, it was the shift in the mindset around what food is, right? And mm -hmm. every time you ask the question, well, what is food? What is food? You hear it constantly that food is fuel. Food is fuel. It's, it's energy. It's all these other things. Not saying it doesn't do those things, but the biggest thing that I walked away with was hearing that food is instructions to my body and so yeah. what instructions are you putting in your body like what are you telling yeah. it and we all get that when we eat a certain food that doesn't agree with us or we don't like or some people who have allergies it sends a very clear instruction what to do right can you expand on that a little bit before we do a quick little 
wrap up with some. Yeah, food, I think this is the thing, right? When we ask the question, what is food? People most often say it's fuel or energy. But actually, that's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, saying that gas is the only thing that makes your car go. It's a Mm. whole system of things. And actually, what food is, is information. And so what people Mm. don't understand is that, so let's say that you have, let's say that you have the genes in your body to express cancer or you have the genes in your body to express dementia or you have um, genes in your body to uh, express elite uh, elite athleticism right those are those are genes in your body what people misunderstand is that your environment your entire environment is what dictates whether or not those genes get expressed. So think about like a bunch of levers. You might have one lever for cancer and 10 for dementia and four right. for athleticism. People don't understand that if you cannot, um, uh, or sorry, people don't understand that, that of all of your environmental factors, food is the number one factor that has the greatest impact that you can influence on the expression. So yes, other things in your environment are going to express uh, those genes as well. But food is the one that has the greatest impact and it's the one that you can control. And so when you're consuming food, it's like you're pulling different levers. And so the idea is that you want to focus on consuming food that sends the best instructions because that's actually what food is. Food is an instruction. So you want to, you want to, consume food that sends the best instructions to your body about which genetic levers to pull. I did quickly see a comment there about about focus on the result, and I 100% agree with that. You have to focus on the micro gains and and the sustainable changes and bring your self-efficacy up, right? The idea is that you have to look at yourself like you're winning all the time with Mm -hmm. this food journey and, and most things in life, actually. You just have to be like, yeah, I ate a salad today. That's a win. Christopher, hold that thought. I know we started a little bit three minutes late, so I'm going to try to pack in a couple of things before we go to the outro and then come back to you really quickly. So is there one thing, sure. just the event that someone has to go and start their week, is there one thing, because we talked about this last week when we had Dr. Breen and I challenged people, I said, if there's one thing you can do, right, if you could just cut out the sugar, the breads, the, the grains of processed stuff for just one day, uh, let me know. And so is there something folks can do this week based on some stuff that you were, you were talking about as far as food and the habitual stuff? Is there something that you could suggest folks do this week that will get them closer to a healthy transformation, so to speak? Yeah, you know what I would do? I, I think there's a whole bunch of things we could do. I think the one thing that if I could get folks to do is w- w- when they're consuming food, I would like them to actually give them, uh, you know, especially during this like whole COVID thing. I, I mean, surge capacity, people are burnt out, right? Like we're just right. so burnt out, right? And and I think if I could get people to, regardless of what's on their plate, be proud of the healthy choice that they've made. You know, may, maybe you threw a couple of carrots on, you know, on a, plate of lasagna or something maybe, maybe you threw you know maybe maybe you had some greens you know with with banana bread and you know like a green smoothie with banana bread focus on the fact that you had the green smoothie you know i i think we just need to to okay. be giving ourselves a whole bunch of self-love right now you know and so focus I- on what you're doing well and not what you're not doing well I love that. And Christopher, I just plugged your information in the chat for folks who they need it. I also threw the link in for the Healthy Transformation website. Now we are going to update this week and next week some information as we get the next um, year's program set up. So you could always come back and check back or reach out to Christopher directly. Is there anything else? I you would even say, say book, book, book a, you know what, book a private consult with Dr. Breener myself at this mm-hmm. stage. We We do have a a date on there for an information session, but we're going to be moving that date. And so, and so I would say, you know what, instead of coming to that book a private consultation, what we have found is that when people can share their story with us, there's a greater likelihood that they're going to understand the healthy transformations program. So, so, you know what, don't, you know, don't worry about like, you know, whether or not you're going to join the program, focus first on what it is that you need to gain knowledge on. And we'll share the concepts of the program with you and then you'll make a choice, you know, but, but book that consultation with Dr. Breen or myself. 
Yeah, and on a final and note, you can just those... reach out to the email that's on the website. Yeah, and also one of the things I know people have done and they could do as well is if you know someone that you care about that's struggling with inflammation and weight loss and you don't know how to get the information to them, they could also consult with you guys to find that out yeah. and maybe help that person against the information, correct? A hundred percent. Yeah, because you don't want to tell someone, hey, you need to go to this because you're fat, right? Like, you know, it's just like there's other caring ways of being mindful of, of, yeah. of that for people. All right, Christopher, thank you so yeah. much. Oh my goodness, there's so much. Of course, you know, we're going to have to have you back. Uh, I think we're doing that next month again. Um, uh, we're going to bring you back a uh, different uh, style. Uh, thank you for not um, taking me on again this time, but I'm sure there's always the Q&A, so we'll see what that looks like. Folks, stay there. Do not go anywhere. I see Kristen's head just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She knows how I'm a victim. Anyway, so let's just take a quick outro. We're going to come back for those who wanted to uh, hear a little bit more of the Q&A. If you like this, please share it with those people in your networking community. Uh, Christopher and I will talk about a podcast segment as well in the Q&A session after a meeting. So thank you. Have a fantastic week uh, for those who have to go and those who are staying with us. We will be right back. <music> Christopher, thank you so much. I mean, you know, we can talk about this all day, you know, every day, you know, and we want to get to less, less. And um, Yvonne made some comments and I want you to be able to kind of address that um, briefly. But, you know, I, I take a look at what the program has done for me personally. You know, I think it was almost 65 pounds that I lost since joining the program. And then with my COVID curve of an extra 12 pounds, and then now I have like six, uh, six or eight more pounds to go. And so what I found because we've done the program it's so much easier to lose the weight. Like it's so much easier when you have that yeah. knowledge to then get back into that, you know, to, to yeah. correct the inflammation. I mean, I'm sure people are saying the same thing who's been in the program, right? And there's some of them who's on here. Yeah. Yeah, there are a few participants on here. Actually, Shane is one of those participants too. So, so Shane, can we unmute you for a second? I'd like to just ask you a couple sure. questions. Sure, yeah, Hi. sure. Hello. Shane, how much weight did you lose? Uh, I think I was sitting at like 220 or 230 and I lost about 50 pounds or so, 50, 60 pounds or something. Yeah. And, so. But Jim, you said that the most notable thing for you was around the thing that was going to keep you going was actually the clarity that you had in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I found that, uh, and I, I know that this is one of the things with uh, healthy transformations is that at least at least I found it, it cleared up my thinking. Like I, I could think a lot clearer and I, I, I wasn't clouded, I guess. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just. That's it. Shane. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm not sure you how to. Yeah. 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 So this is one of the things that I think people misunderstand is that they think, you know, they think about weight loss in a silo, but actually it's really connected to so much more. You, you know, the symptoms of inflammation range from everything from weight gain to, you know, our, our, arthritis and and uh you know blood sugar levels and um but but also including fogginess and mood mm -hmm. like if you want to change your mood change your food mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. and fogginess too so you know shane shane that was probably shane's greatest impact mm -hmm. so certainly mm -hmm. you know everybody's like oh he lost how much weight and yeah. shane's going yeah but you don't understand how clear my mind is yeah right. Yeah. And in yeah. my case, thank, how beautiful thank you my for that skin point. is. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Shane. Christopher, can you take a peek at, I'm not sure if you have it on your screen there, what Les sure. um, kind of commented on. And then uh, I think Yvonne had a, something right after that. But if you just want to read that out, just so for those who are listening. Um, so this says, in, in any changes we do for ourselves, I think we or me tend to focus on the lack of total result versus acknowledging smaller improvements along the way. Society focuses so much on the result versus the process. 
<clears throat> you know, I think Les hit the nail on the head there. And I, I, I don't know if you're still on Les, but that I, I think he hit the nail on the head there. I, you know, with, with all of this stuff, weight loss is only, only sustainable when you focus on the process. Because, it, because um, you know, and this is something that Dr. Breen and I talk about, is that it, it's consistency over time and intensity, right? We can have people who have great surges you know, in this program or anything that, that is behavioral, but it's the sustainability that we're focused on, right? And so I agree, like, you, you know, part of what Les is talking about is this thing of, of self-efficacy, actually. It's about, it's about saying, um, and actually, this is a, a term that Dr. Breen and I use all the time. We talk about the averageness of food or the averageness of food choices. And so when we hear the word average, we tend to think of it as a very negative thing, Right? It's like, oh, you're average. And I don't know why we have that connotation. It's a very strange thing. I think it's because we crave significance. You right. know, but, but actually, if you look at the averageness of correct eating, okay, let's say that I had zesty cheese Doritos on Friday. But maybe that was the only time I had zesty cheese Doritos in the last 12 months versus previously where it might be three times a week. A week. Mm-hmm. And a traditional kind of you know, program or food modeling, that's considered a failure. But we look at it from the perspective that your averageness has gone up, your averageness of correct eating, your averageness of uh, a compliancy to, you know, being support- subordinate to your own goals or to your own health outcomes. So we consider averageness in that case a really positive thing as we're increasing our averageness of correct eating. This all or nothing model um, uh, really creates, you know, um, obsessive behaviors and thinking around things like food. And, and then we just throw in the towel, right? We just throw in the towel and, right. and we stop and it's like, well, I'm screwing up. So who cares? I'll try again next January, you know? Well, you know, and you know, when I hear that for a lot of people, because now, you know, they just don't know what to do. There's so many things and they get really frustrated. I mean, I didn't realize this until um, a few years ago when people have been trying to lose weight or manage, they're trying to lose weight, but not managing the inflammation for years. And they've done Weight Watchers, they've Mm -hmm. done all these other programs. And there's folks out there saying that you can still eat bread. And, you know, um, so all this stuff is happening. So what do they do? Like, how do they get access to this? Because what I love is it's no longer in person, right? Meaning it could really reach those other people who've reached out before asking Mm -hmm. for this kind of connection. Yeah. Sorry, Carl, was there a question? No, I'm just sharing my thoughts, just how so many people are having an issue with it, right? Well, Mm -hmm. what could you say to those people who've struggled for so long then, that who's trying to lose, been trying to lose weight for a long time? Yeah, I think all all the more reason, you know, Mm -hmm. why why you need to reach out and have a conversation. I I think, you know, I think people forget about about the fact that, you know, success has never been a straight line. So, so if you're like, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to nail it and I'm going to stay that way for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. If, if, if people are going to, you know, do that, then actually you're setting yourself up for failure. Your expectations are not in line with reality. Reality suggests that it's a journey and it's not going to be a straight line. And I'm telling you, you know, weight loss or otherwise, there are some dips along the way, right? Like there's some detours, sometimes detours last for days, weeks, months, or even years, right? But the idea is, is, that, is that we just have to recognize that it's a part of a journey. Like I'm telling you, when you exercise self-compassion mm-hmm. with failure, then, then your ability to get back on the path comes much faster than if you beat yourself up. So Christopher, can you, for just those folks, um, this is the part I usually pick on Carmel or, or Catherine, um, but what is self-compassion? Let's just layman's term. What exactly is that? Because we know how to beat yeah, ourselves up pretty good. Yeah, yeah self-compassion is, it, you know, it's usually when you recognize that there's something inside of you that you're being hard on yourself about, right? Okay. So maybe you're feeling guilt or shame or, or maybe you feel that you need to be you, you know, practice hard paternalism or, you know, mm-hmm. which is like a, you know, do this or that failure, right? Like hard discipline. Um, self-compassion is recognizing when that's happening and just saying, you know, what? it's okay. It's going to be okay. And it is okay. And I know that I, I, I know that I would like to make another decision, you know, right. the next time that this thing happens, but it's about kind of that thing of, you know, it sounds a little bit hokey, but self-love, right? It's about that check-in and say, you know, this, 
this dialogue is not helping me, the simplest way of practicing it is like, take the last thing that you were hard on yourself about food, uh, for example. So let's say that it's like you had like a night that you just, you know, binged on ice cream or something, you know, ice cream and chips and Oreos and, you know, whatever it is. And, and you're just like, oh, God, like I suck. Okay, so, so, okay, let's say that that's the thing that you're being hard on yourself. Listen to that internal dialogue. Okay, right. well, is that, is that the same thing that you would say to me? So let, you know, let's say that I'm having a hard day and or a hard time. I mean, COVID has been hard on everybody. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't eat something junky in the last five months. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and yet there were some, you know, there was, there was a couple of binge nights in the beginning there. It was like, I'm going to show up and coach and the rest of this is going to be eating, <laughs> right? So just right. pacifying, right? And it, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, not my best moment. So I could sit there and obsess over it and be hard on myself. Or I could say, you know, and, and this is the thing. So I'm, I'm being honest with you guys. I'm telling you this. So are you guys sitting there telling me what you tell yourself? Are you saying, oh, Christopher, you're a piece of garbage, like, like smarten up? Like, are you saying that to me? Are you saying, are you saying, oh, oh, Christopher, come on, like shape up. Oh, Christopher, mm-hmm. throw out that food. Oh, Christopher, everybody's going through this. That's so hard. You know, like get over it. Like, are you saying that to me? Mm-hmm. No. I don't think so. You're not saying that to me. Are you saying it to yourself though? Yes. That's Absolutely. the thing. Absolutely. So the idea would be to say, what would I say to Christopher or to my best friend? I would say, you know what? This is a hard time. It's going to be okay. Let's not overfocus on it. Could you throw in a salad? Mm-hmm. You know, could, could, you know could, you, could you take 10 steps to walk to the end of your walkway if you can't make it all the way around the block? Could you do that, even if it's in your slippers? But you know what, Christopher? It's going to be okay. Right? So, so self-compassion is, you know, it, in a weird way, it's kind of like, how would you talk to a friend? Mm-hmm. Right? How would you talk to a friend yourself. who is really going through a hard time? Mm-hmm. You know, I like that. I'm just curious from a, you know, this healthy transformation is so important. Even now, if I could just pivot to Dr. Breen for a second, um, just to, to find out, because we talked about this last time when Dr. Breen was on, but why is healthy transformation so important now to manage the weight and actually reduce the amount of inflammation? Um, I know we last week we, we talked a little bit of a video, but from your words, like why? Welcome, Dr. Breen again. Well, Thanks for having me back again, and I apologize, Christopher, for stepping on your uh, toes in your time here. Happy Quite to have you here. Right? <laughs> Great to be back. Great question, Kyle. The, uh, it, was, it was brought up a little earlier. I had to step away to treat somebody, but when I came back here, Christopher was talking about the impact that inflammation has on the body, and really a significant piece of what's showing up in the research uh, right now is the relationship that inflammation has on the function of immunity and that Mm -hmm. the conditions that are connected with inflammation, be it cardiovascular disease and Parkinsonism and Alzheimer's and autoimmune diseases and type two diabetes, all of these things have one thing in common and it is compromised immunity. And right now that is really a foundational piece of what we're dealing with is those people who are the most significantly affected by COVID are the people who have compromised immunity. And so reducing inflammation by way of proper food modeling is Mm -hmm. really a very, very important way to get out of this whole circumstance. And Mm -hmm. and one of the other elements that is connected to this, listening to Christopher, uh, uh, was was to say that the self-compassion and the learning and the behavior and the understanding of culture is all just so, so critically important. as long as we also continue to learn about the importance of food. And that's one of the things that's happened in our culture is that we've really downplayed the importance of food. It is the single most important thing that any of us will do that will determine our health outcomes. More important and we have, than any and other we have control and we literally and we have, control, have over control over it. Yeah. And yet we've ceded control to the food marketers and the food advertisers. And all these. They've created the tone. They've created mm-hmm. the interpretation of what food is supposed to be and healthy transformations takes that back. We say, no, you get to choose. Don't believe right. these people. You get to decide what's right. And when you understand the importance of that, mm-hmm. you combine that with the behavioral support and, and you've got a life of health right in front of you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Breen, um, for that. Uh, folks, I'm actually curious. I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about an, an imperfect inspired action right now, which is, would you guys like to have both Christopher and Dr. Breen come back? I think it's October now. Um, come back in October, both of them. I don't think we've ever done that, right? Have two people co-host. <laughs> Let's live on the edge here, guys. I'm taking action here. Uh, we would love to have, would you guys be up for that? Anyone, please just throw that in the chat. Would you be interested in having both of these guys to come back to talk a little bit more about this? Look at all those yeses flooding in already. Uh, in October, because I think we have our September full, but in October, would that be okay for these guys to come back so we can talk very um, quickly and as well as you know having some detail and context of be able to do that dr Bree, i'm going to challenge you would you be able to come back in october to do that oh challenge accepted okay although the trick is going to be when two people are talking at the same time on zoom it gets very hard <laughs> christopher and i are always talking over each other it's yeah, true. So you, guys, yeah. you yeah. guys should be used to it by now christopher would you be up for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like that. And, you know, Kyle, I think that the thing is, is that people have so many questions, right? Yeah. So, you know, geez, bring your questions to that, too, because I think health, yes. you know, there's so many, you know, when we talk about the marketers and stuff like this, I think there's so much confusion about what is correct. And actually, there, there, there is a correct, you know, there is a correct path here that is research based. And I think folks bring your questions to that for sure. And uh, and Dr. Breen and I will, you know, will come prepared. We're yeah, always gone, prepared, though. Yeah, I mean, we, we you know, we do, this, so... we do this at least once a week. We're on we're on with our groups at least once a week because we run two groups, and and we're on at least once a week for ninety minutes. And so it's like, and and yet then we get together over, you know, like we might maybe go have a meal or something. Yeah. And and, and we get together, and what are we talking about? We're this. still talking about. It. Uh, folks, we didn't get a chance just to hear anyone today. We've gone way over time, but maybe in a quick minute, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask uh, either Christopher or Dr. Breen? And like I said, we will definitely get more into this when they're both back with us. But is there a burning question? Whoever unmutes and goes on right now and starts speaking gets that chance. So if you have a question, uh, please unmute yourself and then uh, ask away. We'll give you a few seconds here I always have a question perfect there you are Go <laughs> Hi, ahead, Nice to see you. <laughs> oh great to see you guys great presentation Christopher um, thank you I think one of the things I know your your um, that healthy transformation made a huge difference in my life even though I, the last year has been kind of a slip but you learn so much one of the things that I think if you can share is how how many days or weeks does it almost take to get the addiction of sugar or pasta or bread that brings you like it's an addiction to almost yeah. cold turkey out of that to start yeah, making it easier. It's, it's a whole other meeting. Such a great, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, it's such a great question and it is multi-layered. So I'll do my best to break it down with the time that we have, which was seven minutes ago. Um, so thank you for that question. So here's the deal is that sugar is not an addiction clinically. So it is not defined as an addiction clinically because it doesn't have the same, there's specific criteria for addiction and, and sugar addiction doesn't meet the criteria. So <clears throat> first understand that, that clinically it is not seen as an addiction. What I would say, on a personal note, is that I don't agree with the clinical definition of addiction. I, I think it is incorrect. Um, sugar is a psychological addiction, right? So, so if you understand that <clears throat> how cravings and stuff work, when, when you spike your sugar, the second that your insulin kicks in and your sugar resp response starts to come down, you start craving sugar immediately. So how long does that take? Well, we've seen people kind of turn it around and stop craving sugar within a couple of weeks. We've seen that. Habitually, though, it's totally different. We've seen people take more than a year to kind of curb that, you know, where they put a carrot in their mouth and they spit it out because it, it's like, oh, I thought I was eating a gummy bear because it was so sweet. We actually had somebody who had that experience, right? right? And, so, and so, you know, the more you 
you dip into sugar, of course, the, you know, the more you kind of perpetuate it. So we're dealing with, with neuroplasticity here, you know, which is all about habits and habit formation and habit change. And we're dealing with, with uh, sh sugar chain, you know, like, like um, uh, the glycemic uh, response, right? So, so, so there's a couple of different factors. And then there's also this concept of the microbiome, right? So like when you eat junky food, the bugs that like the junky food reactivate and they start craving junky food. The bugs always eat before you eat. Right. So then if you eat the cheese Doritos, you reactivate the kinds of bugs that like those and then you'll start to crave them more. So we're kind of dealing with like, you know, three, three or four really key factors here. So what we have noticed, the simple answer is what we have noticed is when people kind of follow our program, which is you eat five times a day, uh, uh, varying portions and different kinds of foods when you eat, you know, that many times and you're eating low glycemic foods, the response to the sugar craving curbs much faster. It curbs much faster. So, so it, if you're kind of keeping that in mind, it, it, it can happen very quickly, right? And then you'll find that you don't miss it. But it is, it is about the consistency of the application. And man, it's a journey. It's not a straight line. So I hope that answered your question, Daryl, in yeah. some form or another. Great question, though. Yeah, I think, Dr. Breen, 30 seconds or less. I know it doesn't mean anything to you, but 30 seconds or less, Dr. Breen, what do you have to add to that? <laughs> Christopher just applied for my job right there. I think that's what he was doing. <laughs> I've been listening. Uh, I now only have 20 seconds. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, behavioral, the behavioral part is a, is a key thing, and that relates back to patterns and mm -hmm. culture and desserts and picnics and summers and you know all the things that are connected with certain food behaviors. The other part of the question is physiological. Blood sugar is a big thing, Christopher, touched on that, but it's also the biochemistry of the rest of our body. And right. real briefly, when we eat the very best foods, the most correct foods, the biochemistry changes. And as the biochemistry changes, then everything changes with that. And cravings are, physiologically speaking, a byproduct of our biochemistry. So as we mm -hmm. control biochemistry, then the, then the uh, desire to want to consume those foods changes significantly but in particular blood sugar responses are a really really big deal in physiology if we don't get blood sugars right a whole bunch of things go amok thank you christopher lawrence dr brain thank you so much i will see you in a month or so uh time great information thank you all for joining this was the longest meeting ever and it was full of great information. So we will what see you, you next expect? week when we have this guy with us uh, who's going to be talking about big picture planning, uh, Craig Turvet, uh, who does a lot of um, uh, wills in the States planning and stuff like that. All right, guys, get out of here. I have a nine o'clock meeting. I will talk to you guys soon. Take care. Thank you again.